Thank you very much for attending today's conference. I want to thank the uh, Elon Administration uh, Forest Bureau Council of Indigenous People for providing uh, us with the uh, reviewing services and the surprise gifts. And then there are some housekeeping announcements. First of all, in order to prevent COVID from spreading, please scan the QR code before you enter the venue and also make sure that you have your mask on all the time. And please make sure that you wear a batch and there's no eating or drinking inside the venue. And also there are bathrooms available on the two sides of the venue. There are also bathrooms available on the first floor. And please bring your own mugs for drinking water. And please don't spill water inside the venue. And because we have a very tight uh, agenda today, and please make sure that uh, you need to return back to the venue after the break. And also during the presentations, please make sure that you turn off your cell phones and also set your phones to the vibration mode. And also in the inside the venue, please do not record or uh, video record the entire session. Thank you. And there are two days of the conference, and today we have two keynote presentations and two panel discussions. And for every session, we have about 150 to 180 minutes, and we have 60 minutes for the panel discussion. And every speaker has 40 minutes for your part, and five minutes before the end of your session, we will remind you. And then if you have any questions, please raise them on Slido. Please scan your the QR code on your badge so that you can be directed to Slido to raise your questions. If you wish to write down your questions, you can do so, but please make sure that you identify yourself on the uh, sheet of questions. And then for uh, session three, the top is community-based ecotourism. The moderator is Ms. Song Liru, Director of Economic Development Council of Indigenous Peoples. Let's welcome her. Good morning, everyone. I'm Song Li Ru, uh, Director of Economic Development from the Council of Indigenous Peoples. And also, my indigenous name is Obushilo. It's difficult to pronounce, I know. And yesterday, during the opening ceremony, there is a person named Masalu from the Asian uh, network. Uh, also, Masalu means uh, thankfulness in the uh, in our indigenous uh, language. So I believe that maybe he's somehow related to the our indigenous community. So I want to welcome you to participate in this session. The topic is community based ecotourism. This is a very interesting topic. Because we can think about how we can promote ecotourism based on community. Or how can we create a win win situation with the community? I think that's a very difficult task. If we take the indigenous community as an example, 
I think that it will take a very long time for us to develop the program. So be it culture or be it uh, eco tourism, you may think that this is easy. How come it's taking so much time? I think probably because our mindset is very different from other people. If you have a chance to develop your program in any indigenous community, so you have to, you know, put yourselves in the shoes of that community because every community has their different historical context and different cultures, languages, and customs. So you want to develop uh, your travel programs with any indige indigenous community. You really have to learn from the community first. So I'm really honored to be invited to moderate this session because we would like to learn more about how we can help communities to work together with other communities to create a better future. This is really a very interesting topic, and we see a lot of NGOs which are trying to manage uh, ecotourism um, programs. But I know that there are a lot of limitations in rules and regulations, so you really have to comply with the law. So today we're also going to talk about how to solve the legal issue here. So I'm really happy to have the opportunity to moderate here. And in this session, there are three speakers. So we can all learn from them. We can from these experts, researchers, as well as hands-on uh, practitioner. So without further ado, I would like to introduce a very special speaker who is a very successful coordinator who is also very passionate in leading organizations and communities to move forward. Now, let's welcome Mr. Peter Richards. Okay. Thank you very much to the Taiwan Ecotourism Association for the chance to join you and to share experiences today. So my name is Peter Richards, uh, and I'll be talking about local to global tested tools for successful community-based tourism, international supply chain partnerships with uh, lessons learned from Asia and Africa. Um, my experience uh, is about 20 years uh, at the crossroads of community development and responsible tourism. I've worked with uh, all kinds of different tourism stakeholders, and I'm particularly interested in how to uh, create market linkages and support um, local sustainable and responsible tourism products. Um, today, many of the lessons which we will share in the presentation were refined uh, through work in Myanmar. And obviously, this work has been massively impacted, uh, not only by COVID-19, but also by the, the very tragic military coup. So uh, I share these lessons with gratitude to our colleagues and our friends in Myanmar uh, in the hope that this work can be useful to CBT and ecotourism practitioners in other parts of the world and hope for peace uh, to return to Myanmar as soon as possible. Uh, today, many of the lessons uh, which will be shared uh, are based on um, the five C's of community-based tourism development. And just for your information, uh, the full online course of the five C's, each step of the five C's process, is available free of charge on the International Trade Center SME Academy website. Okay, and that includes um, videos from myself and Pochana Suansi, my, my colleague, and uh, in-depth uh, tips, techniques uh, on, for example, building trust in local communities, uh, pricing, product development, so if you're interested to learn more, please check it out. Thank you. Uh, the International Trade Center is um, a UN organization. I worked for ITC for six years. It was a fantastic uh, learning experience. And basically ITC 
uh, supports uh, SMEs to thrive and survive in, in global trade and sees communities as, as a micro enterprise. So I worked um, on two projects, which were both uh, supply chain projects connected to community based tourism. One was the uh, Netherlands Trust Fund Myanmar Inclusive Tourism Project, and the other was the EU funded Gambia Youth Empowerment Project. And both of these uh, were working on an end to end uh, supply chain approach. So basically working with each of the actors along the supply chain from the communities uh, through to the international tour operators who need to work together uh, to make these CBT and ecotourism experiences uh, commercial success. Uh, we're, we're lucky to be able to do this work. And in the end, the reason uh, that we're able to do it is because of demand. And so for 20 years, uh, as we know, more and more tourists have been searching for great local experiences which benefit local people. And the good news, as far as we have it, is that this trend will continue after COVID, uh, albeit with the need for more safety precautions. So, for example, um, research by CBI in Netherlands uh, on European market demand for CBT uh, in the uh, post-COVID recovery period uh, found six arising trends which will benefit CBT. And this includes uh, demand for authentic experiences and uh, desire to uh, take a holiday in uncrowded places. Of course, alongside health and safety uh, and in the uh, difficult post-COVID period, affordability will be very, very important as well. So the community-based tourism promise. What's the CBT promise? It is a great local experience with real local benefits. Okay, here we have an example in Kyrgyzstan uh, with our, our, our friend learning how to make a traditional Kyrgyz felt from, uh, from the auntie here. Okay, um, it's essential when we start to talk about CBT that we, we recognize the difference between simply welcoming tourists in the village and community-based tourism. So let's start off with looking at what is not CBT. CBT isn't simply visiting a rural village uh, CBT is decent work. It's not charity. It builds local capacity and opportunity for local people to offer good quality services for a fair price. And it's also not an example of corporate social responsibility. CBT is a real, often cultural tourism product. And it's not just a token example of CSR. And this is a really key understanding um, if we want to scale up the sales of community based uh, tourism and community based ecotourism uh, in uh, international supply chains. When we're working with our partners, <clears throat> we have to help them to understand that CBT is not just a tokenistic, um, you know, good practice. It's actually a great product which can have great customer feedback uh, and can be successful for the uh, customers, businesses and the communities themselves. So what are some practical principles of real CBT? These are just three, but there are three which I think are particularly important. So first of all, it requires capacity building to prepare community members to welcome guests and to manage and deliver tourism services. So we're looking at rigorous preparation. Two opportunities uh, are shared for work and income between uh, people in the community and they're not restricted to a small clique or a couple of families. And three, uh, cross-cultural exchange. CBT isn't just mechanical. Uh, the the texture the, of the experience uh, requires uh, cross-cultural exchange. In terms of empowerment, which we frequently refer to when we're thinking about community-based tourism, the key question is, do local community members retain influence and authority over decision making and to what extent? When we're talking to the villagers, to so the community members, then we have to package our ideas in a very simple format. And what we've found works is the idea of do, learn, feel, share. So the visitors will do something rather than simply observe. They'll learn something from the hosts. They have a chance to feel impressed, curious, amazed, proud. And also they share their experiences together with the community members and also uh, often with their colleagues or with their family members. And when the community does a great job creating or curating this experience, then obviously they benefit. They benefit financially and also from skills, from networks and so on. And to enable this to happen requires preparation and partnerships and management. So when we're talking to the villagers, when we're training, we start off with these simple keys. And I guess the most fundamental thing is that um, whatever uh, experiences or products or services are offered, 
Uh, they need to be based on what the local people feel proud and comfortable to share with guests, uh, which also has market potential. So we're talking about local experiences with local guides, local experts, local food, local activities and local accommodation. These are some photographs from our, our work in southern Myanmar with our uh, White Sand Beach picnic and fishing gallery and so on. Also, management and coordination is key and capacity building in management in accounting uh, is, is a key success factor. From the tour operator and tourist point of view, the absolute heart of success is a warm welcome and a great experience. So when we're having these usually somewhat technical discussions, we have to always bear in mind that the key importance of this warm welcome and experience with which the tourists themselves can relate to. So that's the reason that um, uh, we have Marin there in the photograph uh, rather than a, a local eagle trainer, because the tourists themselves need to be able to relate and think that could be me yeah, in that photograph. Okay. Um, a lot of the lessons which we will share today are based on um, work in uh, Kaya State, uh, which is in, in Myanmar. And we had a very interesting project there for uh, uh, you know three years, extended to another three years, uh, to work with the uh, the Gayan or the Long Neck Karen people. Uh, and one of the interesting aspects of this uh, challenge is that uh, we had the chance to do uh, create a new model of tourism with the Gayan. The Gayan are sometimes known as a human zoo or gated communities um, controlled by tour operators. Uh, and uh, here in Myanmar, they were uh, in their original homeland. And we were able to to create a, a full uh, immersive Kayan experience, uh, discussing, talking, sharing about art, culture, food and so on. Working from the field all the way through to the fairs. The key results of this work prior to COVID and the coup uh, included uh, three seasons of successful cooperation between local community members, local tour operators, national level DMCs and international tour operators, uh, growth in international arrivals of 390%, growth in market share, over 130 tour operators selling these new programs, uh, and also equally as importantly, new skills, new voice, new confidence, new social capacity and, cap and capital for ethnic minority community members who are emerging from conflict. And unfortunately, it looks like that conflict may be returning, which is incredibly, incredibly sad. Uh, it was a very hopeful place to work uh, over the last four or five years. And I hope that hope can return. Um, the project was recognized uh, by the SCAL Sustainable Tourism Award in 2020. Everything was looking good. Uh, we had uh, extension and replication of our work in the Kayan village in uh, in a Kaya community, which is another ethnic group with um, more cultural programs, a uh, local Kaya barbecue, ox cart uh, driving, driving uh, in a village called Teku, which was a Kayo ethnic village with trekking, uh, more cultural programs. And then the uh, project was extended to the south of Myanmar. This was very interesting because uh, in the south, it was more of a leisure and beach destination. So we had to work to develop uh, community-based experiences uh, which could work in a, in a beach and leisure uh, profile environment. So we had, for example, the White Sand Beach Picnic, uh, fishing experiences, the local fishing gallery, local snacks, all um, developed and uh, uh, shared by local community members. This is in Galantar, which is an orchard community in the south of Myanmar. So showing a different aspect uh, of, the, of the south of Myanmar uh, visiting local orchards, fruit orchards, together with um, local farmers. And they had a, a beautiful hot spring there where you can soak your, your toes. Although at the moment, all of this is, is obviously on pause. Um, in the south, we um, rolled out our CBT development process from the very, very beginning as a training of trainers process. So we asked uh, local young professionals in the way in Tanintari region to apply to join our program. And for more than one year, every month, uh, they join two or three days of activities learning how to be uh, trainers, facilitators, uh, CBT, uh, budding CBT experts. And we had some fun in the rainy season as well, surveying. <laughs> this was also extended, uh, as I mentioned, uh, through the uh, Youth Empowerment Project uh, in the Gambia. So we were very, very lucky to work together with uh, tourism experts and uh, active youth uh, in the Gambia. And these uh, CBT programs now are actually up and running 
Um, despite COVID, I've seen some uh, some notes and some Facebook posts from our friends in the Gambia that the uh, community-based tourism programs in Jamali and Tabanani are, are up and running and welcoming guests. So what happened in Myanmar, very sadly, yeah, was COVID uh, plus coup. So this is, uh, so far, uh, a serious obstacle. Uh, and of course, the tourism programs are a minor issue in the overall challenges being faced by our friends over in, over in Myanmar. So let's look at what lessons that we can learn overall from this work. Um, first of all, it's always good to look at why community-based tourism fails. Uh, this list is, is based on experience. It's based on research as well, but it's broadly based on, on our own experience. So key reasons CBT fails include insufficient awareness raising and training, underestimating the amount of time needed to develop CBT, uh, CBT services, programs and prices being unclear or unreliable, CBT not meeting minimum safety or hygiene standards, activities not being sufficiently engaging or fun, conflict and jealousy between community members themselves, the lack of basic financial or accounting skills, insufficient marketing and promotion, and the lack of marketing networks. And a key here as well is in, in com, inconsistent support uh, for CBT by responsible government agencies. Like it's really something which does take time. It requires a consistent and committed approach. And if, that, if that's there, then it can work really well. So the key to success is a rigorous and systematic approach. And that's what we will have a look at in more detail now. So we, um, we we reflected upon and we summarized uh, all the work that we had done uh, based on prior experiences in Thailand and other countries and then refined in, in Myanmar and, and tested again in the Gambia uh, to uh, summarize these five C's. So the first C is consider, which is um, steps which focus on how to select a CBT destination, build trust and assess potentials. Two, conceive, focusing on how to shortlist and design marketable CBT experiences and programs. So looking from the beginning along the supply chain to, to see, right, how are we going to make these programs as attractive as possible while still respecting what the local people feel proud and comfortable to share with visitors. Craft, focusing on how to build local capacity to welcome tourists and, op and um, offer tourism services. Connect focusing on how to build trusting marketing partnerships and business linkages, but the introductions uh, and the, 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 the outreach to business starts from the very beginning and conserve how to sustain and build on this work. Okay, so uh, this is uh, my colleague, uh, CBT guru, Pochana Suansi, uh, and uh, in the Banpet Kayan community. So the first step is to prepare yourself and your team. What does that mean? It means really seeing on the ground our role as being um, as being trainers and facilitators to build local skills um, and confidence. OK, working hand in hand with people, not only providing one or two days of training, but providing training and follow up coaching and uh, helping people to build skills, which which obviously requires time. Uh, the team requires two pillars to succeed. First pillar is tourism skills. So product development, sales and marketing operations, people in the team have to understand these, these skill sets. And in terms of community work skills, how to mobilize, motivate, mediate conflict if necessary, uh, build capacity and manage the positive and negative impacts of tourism. And I guess from an eco-tourism point of view, uh, you would definitely want to have uh, a conservation or natural resource management uh, skill set there as well. Um, training skills are really, really important. Uh, here we have our three in this uh, training, three co-facilitators working together as a team to facilitate the training uh, on the uh, bottom uh, right hand corner. I think my face is uh, in the way there, but uh, it, this is about pen work and different kinds of key facilitation skills. So we can't underemphasize how important uh, training and facilitation skills are on the ground uh, to, to make this happen. Okay, this is a session plan when we're doing training for our training, uh, training of trainers. Uh, we teach our trainees uh, how to do a proper training session plan, uh, thinking about objectives, content, training process, media and materials, who will work together and how. Um, core to success is the attitude of the facilitator. OK, so it's really, really important to have some joy uh, in, in, in our work, to actually enjoy village life, um, to appreciate uh, the, the many, many strengths and valuable aspects of village life alongside seeing the challenges which we're hoping to help to overcome 
Um, aim to work with diverse groups, be curious, connect with people, cultivate a balanced appreciation of strengths and weaknesses, understand that often our work can't be the top priority for local people, especially at the beginning, so be flexible and adaptable. Um, we have uh, over 20 years um, uh, concluded some key uh, success factors um, when we are assessing the feasibility of a new CBT destination, and these are a mix of external and internal success factors. Obviously, there's no perfect destination, but the more of these factors which are in place, the more likely everything is to succeed. So external factors looking at market potential, connectivity, location, uh, either uh, on easily accessible en route between two tourism hubs or no more than one and a half hours away from a main tourism hub is a good uh, rule of thumb. Uh, the ability to include the new destination in existing tourism routes. So this is absolutely key when we're talking about linking local to global. There are already popular tourism routes and if our uh, community-based ecotourism program can be included in those routes fairly easily, uh, it will make our lives much, much easier and increase our chances to be able to sell the products in the end. Um, internally, looking at uh, unique highlights, welcoming living culture, uh, facilities, uh, and the other other uh, factors, um, including no extreme serious risks, such as, for example, uh, drugs or, or something like that. Um, at the beginning of the process, it's essential to invest time building trust. OK, so we don't go in there from the first day with our own agenda. Uh, we, we go in there uh, kind of uh, quietly and slowly and meet people and try to find out uh, what's important to local people and how local life works. Uh, so you can conduct home visits, join local people in their daily tasks, learn a few words of the language, uh, etc. OK. Um, when we've built some trust, then we go forward to awareness raising. And so we have to package our awareness raising, as I mentioned earlier, in a very simple way, uh, show some videos or some laminated photographs of different kinds of community based uh, or community based ecotourism experiences and encourage the community members to look at them and, and, and uh, ask what are people doing and learning and feeling and sharing and how are the local people benefiting from these experiences. Okay, here we are uh, sending our, our, our movie onto a, a bed sheet uh, pinned to the wall. <laughs> uh, if you have the funds and you're lucky enough, it's always a good idea to organize a study tour. So try to find um, a community which has a comparable context to the community where you're working do good preparation. So, for example, if you're um, inviting uh, community members uh, to visit a community in, in, in Thailand, uh, you would visit the community, which is the study site in advance, and you would brief the, um, the study site uh, very clearly that these, uh, this group is not tourists. They are actually coming to learn how CBT works and giving your participants a good assignment so that they are uh, motivated and primed to observe, uh, observe carefully what's, uh, what's going on around them. OK, conceive if the community members come back and they're interested uh, to start developing CBT. We start with a community study. Uh, we we uh, basically a community study is a systematic way to assess tourism and um, human potentials. And we have various kinds of tools to work together as a team with local volunteers, uh, putting together timelines, uh, external maps to see the relationship between local people and the local uh, resources and um, where they have and do not have rights to uh, to operate potential activities and inside the village what kinds of interesting and skilled people uh, are there in the village that we can meet and invite to participate and who is too busy to be likely to participate as well as a key question okay when we've uh, done the community study then together with the villagers we will uh, brainstorm review everything and brainstorm potential experiences which the local people feel proud and comfortable to share with visitors. We will go and uh, test or, or, or survey these places and people ourselves to make sure that uh, we have an idea of, of uh, risks and, and real potential. And then we will take this long list of ideas to discuss with tour operators and we will ask the tour operators to help us to shortlist uh, this uh, list of potential activities based on how potential activities would be able to meet a significant need or gap which the tour operators themselves are facing. One way that we do this is by uh, putting together uh, a list of possible activities. Okay, uh, here we have um, seven different activities and we ask the tour operators to 
uh, to score or to choose one or two of their top activities. So here they are looking at the potential CPT activities and, uh, and, uh, and scoring so that we can identify uh, based on the activities that the local people themselves do feel proud and comfortable to share with guests, uh, which of them are most attractive and interesting to the tour operators. Okay, and then finally, uh, we're taking these uh, pilot ideas as well for some feedback uh, at the market. So this could be, for example, at a tourism fair like the ITB. When we're doing uh, program design, based on the uh, feedback from the tour operators, we usually begin with more symbolic activities, you know, go to a place where it's possible to have an introduction to the community, to faith, livelihoods and life, and then move into more domestic activities such as home visits uh, or cooking activities or trekking or, or something like that. Uh, this is an example of the Sunset Beach Picnic. So started off with some training from a, a local Guyan chef. Uh, so the fact that she was able to speak the same language as the local ladies in the village um, made them feel confident and uh, gradually uh, developed this activity until it was a, a proper, delicious, fun, inspiring activity. Okay. Uh, when you are confident that there is uh, both market potential and product potential, then you can move on to a community agreement. So we would discuss with various stakeholders inside the community and key stakeholders outside the community. Uh, so the villagers would then make a commitment to continue because the next stages uh, require a lot of work, a lot of effort in various kinds of training. Emphasize future commitment. So, so uh, some of the key trainings which have to be done in order for the products and experience to be professional enough to be able to work together with international partners uh, include helping the local people to train a coordinator, to have a proper booking system, to have an effective accounting system training local tour guides and local resource people. We have a very simple tour guide training mantra, which is the three S's, safety, story and service. And we also um, train the local community members, not only what, you know, like what the content needs to be, but how the content needs to be delivered through the three C's, clear, confident and caring. Uh, here we have uh, local tour guides who at the beginning uh, of the project were very shy, uh, they felt rather overwhelmed meeting um, uh, stakeholders and tour operators from outside and by the end of the project uh, confident to meet a group of 50 tour operators from, from Yangon. So this is a, an example of how the three S's and three C's come together uh, to build the confidence of local tour guides. This is training for local food providers um, on um, hygiene standards which are sufficient for uh, welcoming the international market. Uh, menu, variety, portion sizes. Uh, and uh, one of the lessons that we've learned uh, is uh, it's always good to try to find a balance between something which is kind of unusual and exotic and something which is familiar. People would like to experience something exotic and unusual, but it can be overwhelming for them in reality. So uh, this is a, uh, this was a good balance. It was the, the Kayan barbecue. Uh, so sorry, the Kayan barbecue. So um, People are familiar with barbecue, but they don't know what the Kaya barbecue is. So it's an interesting, uh, interesting for them and, and, and fun to try. Um, we were working with uh, illiterate uh, ladies uh, in the villages. Uh, we weren't able to teach uh, English to the ladies because they weren't able to uh, write down notes and remember. So we tried to create um, media so that the tourists would learn a few words of, of Gayan language. And we did that using these, uh, using these cartoons. Okay. Uh, developing uh, hands-on experiences, uh, using craft activities to showcase local souvenirs, for example. Uh, agreeing on prices is obviously a key part of the process. Uh, it's a challenging part of the process. We tend to look, look at pricing after everybody is confident uh, about the work that needs to be done. They understand how much work it really is to do these different activities. Um, and we help the community members to understand that the price has to be marketable, it has to be profitable um, for the tour operators as well, or they won't be able to sell it. And they have to be able to uh, confirm an annual price because prices in international supply chains uh, are changed, uh, you know, no more than one time per year and often one time every, every two years. We have a tool to do this, which is another five C's, lots of five C's, but this one is to have calculate, compare, create, consult and confirm. So there's more information about that on the ITC online training. Okay, connect. 
this is where we're looking at um, support which is which is needed not only uh, at the local village level but also for the uh, supply chain partners because everybody needs some support to know how to work together as effectively as possible to deliver these experiences and sell them uh, to the market. So we found that uh, often the ground handlers uh, at the local level also need a lot of help professionalizing, uh, even maybe at the level that it's a, just a one or two person operation and they don't really know the key functions of a tour operator such as product development, operations, marketing, etc. Um, we helped uh, the local ground handlers at the, at the local level uh, to organize tabletop uh, networking. Uh, this is an example of uh, tabletop networking in the way when we had a fan trip and the um, national level tour operators uh, met different uh, local uh, tourism providers. Uh, I think this is a key, a key point here is that the tour operators need to know the whole picture. They need to understand the whole destination, especially if it's a new or emerging destination. So it's not enough just to sell community-based tourism or community-based ecotourism. Uh, you have to package CBT or CBET uh, inside an overall understanding of like what's possible in the destination, where to stay, where to eat, what to do, and, and so on. Training for professional tour guides is absolutely essential. They are like at the coal face of the experience. If the professional tour guides don't understand community-based uh, tourism and how it's different and don't know how to work as a team with the local tour guides that it won't be successful in the final step. So uh, essential to train local tour guides. This is an example of training the uh, licensed professional guide how to introduce uh, the local tour guides uh, to, the, to the guests. Yeah? So even at this level of detail, there, there's training. And obviously, when the professional guides, both of these, these young ladies are professional tour guides, when they experience the program themselves uh, without customers, uh, it's relaxing. There's no uh, there's no risk of losing face uh, that they can uh, enjoy and understand and, and become motivated to support CPT. Um, CBI, the Netherlands um, Office for Promotion of um, Imports from Developing Countries, uh, have a great program to support destination management companies and national level tour operators to improve their market uh, access and their market um, export performance. And this was a huge help as well. Uh, there's lots and lots and lots of information on CBI's website about different programs that they have to help national, big national level tour operators to be more professional and, um, and to be more effective in their marketing to the European market. Fan trip is absolutely key. Uh, it's a key to get product feedback uh, and to make uh, changes and adjustments to the to the products and the local community members get the chance to listen directly to tour operators rather than uh, often only to the NGO folk. Provides inspiration and feedback. This is a, 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 a fan trip that we did in, in the way again this was just before Covid kicked off and everything was looking wonderfully positive and then uh, things uh, went downhill but it was it was a good it was a good example of uh, of a of a fan trip with trough raiders coming and experiencing these new leisure orientated community based ecotourism programs uh, it's key to create a destination buzz as i mentioned earlier and to showcase the whole destination so one thing which we did in itc was we created a manual for tour operators and this manual had information about community-based ecotourism, but it also talked about hotels and guest houses, restaurants and cafes, other interesting cultural and natural attractions, etc. So it was basically a kind of small uh, guidebook. And this really, really helped us to promote the, the destination and the community-based tourism experiences as a key uh, part of the destination offer. OK, finally, conserve. So this is maybe more from an NGO perspective, but we have to think about how the uh, experiences will be continued after projects. And I think a key thing is that if those B2B linkages have been formed successfully, then the community based and community based ecotourism programs will simply sell their programs on uh, to their uh, local ground handler partners who will then sell on to the DMCs and the international markets. So at a certain level, the, um, the supply chain linkages automatically um, create sustainability, but obviously they can't guarantee uh, ecological and social and cultural um, responsibility and sustainability. So how to uh, optimize that? One way is to uh, develop a team of local volunteers. Um, they can be affiliated with a local um, civil society or NGO organization, or it could be the junior staff of the local ministry uh, to go and uh, meet the local people, uh, maybe once uh, once uh, once a month or once every two months and uh, 
follow up on, on their experiences, what's going well, what needs some help. So this is an example of, of backstopping. Uh, so here, uh, seven uh, junior staff from the Ministry of Hotel and Tourism were trained how to go into the villages, uh, help the local CBT coordinators to check the accounts, make sure there hadn't been any un, uh, uh, accidental mistakes, uh, which can create you know, confusion or even suspicion, uh, and to work as a team. Collecting data is obviously key. Uh, the key here is that community members themselves don't have a lot of time uh, to collect data. So data, the data format has to be really, really simple. Um, we put together a, a, you know, a, a simple spreadsheet. This is just, just one example. Uh, but uh, I think a key message here is uh, to be very uh, careful and clear about how many indicators that you require to monitor and then to make the, um, the tools for collecting the information as, as simple as possible. When we're talking about uh, monitoring, obviously a key challenge is organizations having a mandate and a budget to do the monitoring. And in the end, uh, the government are in a good position to do that because they will have uh, salaried staff. So um, it's very important to try to work as effectively as possible with local government and to try to build the capacity of the local government, uh, local government uh, staff, especially the operational staff. So, as I mentioned, um, there is a lot of detailed information about uh, the five C's and the different steps of the five C's, uh, which really shows how, you know, in detail how to move from the grassroots uh, to, to, to global markets uh, and, and, and the, the links and work which has to be done along the way. And I hope that this presentation has helped to show as well that we can't only think, at, you know, at, at the market end and we can't only think at the community end, but we have to think at each step. Um, along uh, the supply chain, what inputs need to be in place. So uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm, I'm here and I'm very happy to uh, listen to your questions. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peter Richard, for your share, for your experience. Thank Mr. Richard. Thank you, 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 uh, Mr. Richards talk about uh, every everything is very important. So do we do this um, Q and A at the uh, later session? And since we have some time, uh, allow me to offer some comments. So after his uh, speech, I believe uh, we already have a very comprehensive understanding of the CBT, community-based uh, tourism. Uh, after all, uh, people is the most important element in this uh, discussion. As uh, we have seen it on those slides, um, these are long neck tribe. And Peter says we, we are not supposed to look at them as if uh, there are animals in a zoo. Uh, because when we go on a tour, uh, we are there to appreciate the culture, the people there, because I myself is from an indigenous tribe, so I am very grateful for his uh, comment because we have peoples uh, in the community, um, some of them are illiterate, but how do you create such um, opportunities uh, with um, people in the community. And, and we also have to recognize all the profit generated is to be shared with everyone. But, so this is an important uh, supply chain as uh, Ms. Richard talked about. And the 5C are important elements, the pillars to uh, develop a model, good models for this. Uh, for example, how do you select, how do you develop the uh, 
products as uh, I myself in my tribe we see a lot of products they are so similar for example archery or to pound um, rice cakes and each tribe has their own unique culture so I am from the Taiwan tribe but in Alishan that's another tribe so our tribes uh, specialty should not be sold or be marketed in another tribe's uh, villages so because uh, the uniqueness is uh, important as a, a, a product for you to sell from your particular village and now let's uh, welcome the second presentation from Ms. Lin Zhiyuan is from the Satoyama ecotourism company and he's going to share with us uh, his own experience good morning everyone i am from the satoyama ecotourism i'm from hangchun peninsula that's in the southern part of taiwan <coughs> and in fact my teacher um, Professor Chen is right here in the audience. I feel that as if I'm getting this oral examination for the PhD thesis. And so previously, we, some uh, graduate students, work with uh, Professor Chen to uh, work in the Pengchun Peninsula on how to develop the community-based uh, tourism. And, but this area is part of the Kandin National Park. And back in the year 2002, it was an international year for ecotourism. So in Taiwan, we already also have a corresponding project being launched to develop the ecotourism and then in year 2005, at the Kandin National Park uh, set up a number of places as a model, as a uh, pilot project there. So in the beginning, we have to do inventory of the uh, resources. Uh, could someone help me with the laser pointer? We have to take a stock of all the resources and then we empower the community people and then we begin to develop the packages and after that we begin to operate and then try to find a way to do a sustainable operations and Mr. Lai who is going to present uh, later and and we understand the community based ecotourism CBT uh, ha has to uh, focus on the resources from the community. So um, you have to have the people participate from the community and also do important uh, decision making. There. And we have uh, this uh, a number of um, projects. Together, there are 11 communities that participate in this kind of a CBT project. We have already trained 103 interpreters, and their average age is 50 to 65. And each one has to complete 80 hours of a training before they get a different level of a certificate. And in the beginning, where we have this pilot community it was a dilapidated uh, communities and my teacher a professor Chen, and it's a and some of the local leaders we go to the houses of uh, the residents and try to communicate with them and uh, we were able to get a number of uh, residents to uh, negotiated to discuss uh, how to begin to develop this and what are these uh, uh, rotational working shift and uh, so we conducted quite a number of uh, work uh, meetings before we get some consensus uh, 
there we go. We have a, a pa patrol team to go around the ground, and we found out that the, the people who are more diligent in the go going around the ground, they can do better uh, interpretation. So we decided to have this uh, community interpreters uh, to be a member of this uh, uh, pa patrolling team. And they have to take courses, uh, get examined before they get a certificate. And uh, so starting in the year 2006, we have a day trip, the night trip, and then a dear trip, uh, and we begin to think, consider uh, how do we do the feedback because uh, after operating these uh, packages, uh, there was some income. And so on the, from this uh, third year, we begin to have some financial feedback that to offer uh, some uh, financial feedback to the senior citizens in the community. And after we have done this for several years, and because of the dedication to the environment, and also because uh, this is a, a, a ecotourism model. So in the year 2015, on behalf of uh, the Pingdong counties, we were able to get this award. It's a one million dollar Taiwan dollars, and we were very impressed. And because originally this place uh, was was a dilapidated uh, communities uh, with uh, lots of uh, animal um, dungs from this uh, street dogs and with lots of uh, rats. But now uh, it has uh, become a, a model communities for tourists to visit. And in year 2014, um, we begin to form a company. It's called the Satoyama ecotourism companies and uh, to do uh, our, our training work and we also conduct some uh, fairs the you know, street fairs and uh, f uh, uh, festivals uh, activities and we also begin to do some uh, agricultural products development uh, in terms of uh, uh, packaging in terms of uh, content, and so it's helped to uh, improve their income. And we also have pamphlets uh, printed to introduce to tourists uh, to uh, expose them to uh, nice offerings from the space. And we also have uh, some artists. Uh, going to these uh, villages uh, to stay there for a long time and uh, we call the artist in residence and and we use uh, local resources uh, to create these art pieces and there are other type of uh, competitions that we have uh, uh, lots of uh, stu students or professors uh, they are in this uh, design artist design department and they come here to look for the local resources and try to uh, design nice packages uh, to help them to market uh, local uh, agricultural products and the uh, very famous uh, bake bakers in Taiwan uh, world renowned bakers called Wu Bao Chun so we invited Wu Bao Chun to go to the villages uh, to help them uh, to develop uh, different recipes for the, some uh, products. And we, we also have uh, developed some uh, programs such as uh, doing uh, tofu, uh, using DIY tofu and, and things uh, that help you to appreciate the lifestyles and the products in this uh, community. So in year 2014, uh, 2017, again, we got the award um, uh, for developing uh, ecotourism and also uh, uh, contribute a lot uh, to uh, environmental protection. Uh, however, uh, there was no uh, monetary prize. 
and in the Ganko and in the two communities, and they have also uh, got recognized for their, their efforts in developing a CBT. And in addition to such uh, ecotourism, we uh, so begin to look at the different type of activities. Uh, for example, in the past few years, we have the festivals in the Pengchun Peninsula. Over the past uh, seven years, we did. Uh, we also market these uh, type of uh, ecotourism packages and and locally produced uh, uh, eco products. And so this is a place where we showcase the, the products. And we also have some of the uh, folk song festivals to help people understand, appreciate the uh, important uh, forms of uh, local fo folk songs that actually originated from the Ping Hengchun Peninsula, we have a, a number of concerts to help this uh, international music musicians and artists uh, to exchange with the uh, local things. And we also have some uh, dramas or uh, theaters. Uh, so <laughs> although we do ecotourism, but we were able to um, branch out into uh, various type of uh, cultural activities. and. Yeah, and through this uh, drama, through the theater, we we show that how this um, ama, this uh, old ladies, uh, started uh, to learn about this uh, folk song and this uh, important uh, instrument, the, this uh, round instrument, uh, and and this ama, this uh, grandma, uh, uh, were there uh, to sing the folk songs. <laughs> and they are actually in the national level uh, artists, and people were very moved. And during the performance, I saw t two of these um, senior citizens, uh, male senior citizens. They uh, belong to different political camps. But at the end of this uh, performance, uh, both of them uh, shed tears because uh, it helped them to remember these um, uh, situations when they were growing up. So I realized uh, this kind of a cultural activity help people to uh, reach out to, uh, to, to touch uh, different people from a different uh, political camp because we actually were live in the same community and through this um, um, mini mini trips uh, through festivals through concert we are able to help uh, local people to dig into their their heart and uh, to discover this uh, the common elements in their everyday life uh, a lot of them uh, since their childhood so over the years we begin to I develop a program that is a certification of uh, interpreters, a uh, docent or guide. And, and back in the 2016, uh, we ha we were working in many uh, communities. Uh, and by the in the beginning, we only have some entry level um, guides who knew how to do it. But later on, we believe uh, there were some more advanced levels of uh, certificates that can be recognized. So uh, we use this kind of a certification systems, uh, five levels of, uh, from this um, land, sea, and air, and the mountains. And these are all represent uh, the, the different uh, um, features of this, uh, this areas from the uh, deer, from the um, seahorse, from the uh, eagle, and so on. And if and they have uh, this um, tag, they have this. Uh, uh, they can wear. There's a button they can wear to show they are in the advanced level of uh, guide. And in addition to this kind of a uh, um, guide certification, we also do the survey of um, local animals, wild animals, and we rely on the volunteers. 
and after that, we also do a lot. We invited a um, an expert in uh, bird watching to help us uh, to do this uh, surveillance of uh, wild animals, and we also. Um, enter this uh, information into the international database uh, and to talk about maybe uh, this uh, movement or the fluctuation of the number of uh, birds, the wild birds uh, that are visiting these areas. And that also helps to understand the trend and the impact of the climate change. And uh, we do a lot of uh, communication because uh, we have this uh, alliance, uh, eco-tourism alliance, because uh, many of these uh, communities in the beginning, they only uh, will do their own operations independently. But we realize that there is a lot of uh, common themes, a common experience that could be uh, shared to other community. So we decided to uh, form this alliance, and then through this kind of um, uh, work meetings, uh, uh, we could uh, exchange ideas and to uh, forge some consensus about how to deal with uh, some common problems. And this kind of interaction actually helped us to forge a bigger, uh, stronger force. So in the year 2008, we form and the association and through this association we could do the some um, uh, public relation works so it is called as a Kanding ecotourism association um, and and a lot of uh, young people uh, decided to join us. And we also have the Facebook groups and other uh, f social media platforms that um, help to exchange information with young people. And then young people, they can write, they can tell good stories about this. Uh, and that also helps our uh, exposure. We also do some uh, video. In the past, uh, there are some only pictures, still pictures. But uh, we want to um, help we on help people to um, to uh, to um, market our place. So we do the vlog, and some of this uh, film even get the f uh, sixty-four thousand followers. And with uh, all this kind of a uh, different work, our uh, Satoyama. A group and the young people so will be able to do a lot more, a lot more works. So before the COVID broke out in 2019, our revenues grew up to 28 million, and then 120,000 people participated in our event. So we became a commercialized group and started to see concrete results. So we started from building our own community. So I'd like to share some stories with you. So Ganko community is one of the communities that we helped. So there are a lot of resources in that community. But we can see that in this community, you know, is a, a community with uh, mostly senior people. 80% of the population are over 65 years old. So actually, according to the UN definition, if 14% are over 65% is already a senior community. So here I would like to t talk about our village head. So this is her with her mom in Yilan. So why do we talk about, why do we want to talk about her? Because before she served as the village head, she was born in Yilan and she was married to a man in Hengchun. So she only had has a few opportunities to meet her mother in Yilan. 
But she, when she comes back, she always finds her mother very happy, happily engaging in local activities because she saw that local volunteers took very good care of her mother. So she was very moved because there are people there who serve her mom selflessly. So as a daughter who, uh, who lives far away from her mom, she was very touched. So she wanted to uh, help her local people in Hengchun. She wanted to do the same thing. So afterwards, when she served as the village head, she started to promote uh, local activities. She invited local women to serve as volunteers to cook meals for local seniors. And after a few years, and then she got to know more people. She got to know my professor. So she joined our team. So we can see that the volunteers were transformed to become uh, tour guides. And they were able to help us to prepare a local specialty meals. And because of that, they were able to generate incomes. And they were able to use the income to contribute back to the seniors to provide funding to support the local seniors. Well, actually, when we get income, there is a lot of uses. For example, for the senior group in the community, many times, you know, their children are away from home, uh, working in big cities. So the seniors live alone. So they only watch TV every day. They have nothing to do. So they are very lonely. And with our ecotourism, we're able to uh, organize activities to invite the seniors to be back to community to do things together. So they feel that they are not alone. They are taken good care of, and they can, you know, tell their friends in another community that wow, we have this kind of benefits in our community, but you uh, do you have that in your community? So they're very proud of what the community has to offer. And then because of that, in 2017, the Gangko community was able to uh, receive a recognition award. And this is Zhou Pong community. And then we can see this is the village head. So she was married to a Jopong man. We at uh, the Jopong community is a very remote area. So there were no uh, young people. There are only seniors and children in this community. So this lady wanted to change the status quo. And then she later she won the election of the village head. And then she won the election at age 32, and now she's 35. And then she wanted to do more for the uh, community. So she is very, you know, proactive in organizing activities like beach clean up and other engagement activities. And then she won the recognition of the management office of the Kanding National Park. So she was able to. Uh, gain a, the rights to manage a specific uh, scenic area. So they are able to uh, generate more than 4 million new Taiwan dollars for the community. So she totally renovated this community. So in addition to this full, uh, two female figures, well, there is another man in Ho Wan community. She, he used to work in Taiwan Formosa company. And then actually Ho Wan community is where his grandmother lived. So he always, you know, uh, when he was little, he always went back and then went to the beach. And then she, he felt that this beach served as a playground for him to play, for example, baseball. And then in 2000, lots of construction projects started to happen. So people built 
a lot of, for example, tetrapods along the beach. So we can see that that caused a lot of problem to the beach because we see that sand just accumulates uh, on the left left hand side of the beach. And then the local government wanted to do uh, some maintenance work to restore the beach, but this kind of efforts were not su were not successful. So we can see the beach was kind of like destroyed. You know, we can see the before and after picture between 1993 and 2003. So Mr. Liu, you know, felt that. It shouldn't be like this. So he wanted to change the situation. He uh, documented the progress, the change along the way. So he was thinking about how to address this issue. But in the beginning, he was nobody. So no one wanted to listen to him. So he started to be involved in the local management organizations. So he was elected as president of the local uh, community management organization. So he uh, was able to uh, make some changes happen to roll out uh, programs to prevent further deterioration. And he started to work with eco-tourist uh, uh, company, so it was able to generate income and then to put the money into restoration uh, in 2020. Finally, we can see the local authorities uh, agree that to remove half of the tetrapods. So, actually, there was news coverage about uh, his efforts about restoring the beach to the previous state. So this year, you know, he uh, stepped down from his position as president of the local organization, but he continues to make efforts to make sure that uh, the beach is well maintained and preserved. But actually, there are a lot more stories that I want to say, but in the interest of time, I cannot tell them all. But actually, you know, the village has said that, you know, in the community, you know, uh, we can see that it's kind of paid ecotourism is able to help make the environment uh, a happier place for people to live in. But along the way, we still encounter a lot of problems and opportunities. For example, we can see the legitimacy of community management because actually some of the roots belong to the uh, authority of the uh, national competence authority. However, there are people arguing that you know the private goods, the private groups have no rights of using these routes. And also, the second problem is the uh, legitimacy, uh, the the problem of how to create create an environment for young people to come back to work. You know, sometimes we find that it's difficult for the two generations to communicate. However. For the past two years, we see that uh, there are uh, even more challenges emerging. And we can see that in on our ecotourism teams, our partners are aging. So in the beginning, I was a fresh graduate. So I started the business. And then our partners were still very young. They're only in their early 60s. So they can walk and move very fast. However, in recent years, when I went back to the community, I saw that, you know, they are aging. You know, they started to show problems in their health. For example, they have difficulty hearing or seeing 
you know, sometimes it's difficult for them to catch breath, you know, after guiding uh, to uh, tourists. So that uh, reminds me the importance of recruiting new people to support the team. So that is something that I pay attention to recently. So I want to talk about two main challenges uh, with you. The first thing is the uh, uh, legitimacy issue, because you know that we need to have a you know, tourist agency to sell these kind of programs. However, there are relevant uh, re regulations for the establishment of comprehensive and type A and type B uh, travel companies. However, the uh, monetary requirement is quite high. It's difficult for a community to meet the uh, government's uh, regulation. And we can see that sometimes communities launched programs, but in the end, they got a fine from the government saying that they did not comply with the law. So uh, two years ago, we actually, you know, actually pleaded to the government to talk about the revision of the act of the development of tourism. So at that time, you know, we can see there were conflict between us and travel agencies. And then in the end, the government were willing to lower the monetary requirement from 3 million to 1.2 million new Taiwan dollars. But still, it is too high for communities to afford this. So that is why, in the end, we decided to uh, set up our own travel agency called Wind Travel so that we can uh, sell, we can promote this kind of programs. So we focus on the uh, special uh, scenery spots in Hengchun Peninsula. So we hope that with the establishment of the community, we can address the issue of legitimacy. And also the second problem is that the community has no idea of operating costs. So we can see that uh, in order to cater to the public and the communities, uh, sell these uh, programs at a very low price. And that price, you know, is hard to adjust. So the community basically has no profits whatsoever. They don't have, uh, they don't, they do not have enough income to support the administration work of the community. So it's important to educate the community as to how to calculate the cost. So we provide a lot of training courses. So we help them to calculate all kinds of costs to propose uh, suitable, appropriate pricing, and then work with travel agencies. So we spend a lot of time. From last year to this year, we spend at least uh, six months to engage the local community for communications. And also, we had several fights with the local partners. The community leaders agreed to adjust the prices, but actually, you know, many local guy, local tour guys, were worried that you know, after increasing the prices, you know, what if no tourists uh, will want to come to my community? What should I do? So we. That's why there were fights between us, but we tried to uh, convince them, we tried to communicate with them the reason of doing so, because without profits, you know, it's impossible to support the administration work of the community. So, so uh, we announced that we increased our price. We made that announcement. And do you know what happened afterwards? And then we you know Kobe broke out. So that, that's another story. So we know that COVID 
You know, like last year in Hunchun Peninsula, you know, COVID didn't, you know, struck us as hard as Taipei. So in May, uh, we were not able to provide services. We were not able to provide trainings. So nothing could happen. So we were thinking what to do. How are we going to operate? So we discuss and uh, thought about using, you know, like virtual online meetings to provide, for example, training. But that presents us with another opportunity because in Hunchun Peninsula, lots of tour guides are between the age of 50 to 65, and one of them is 84 years old. So you can imagine, you know, senior people may not be able to operate this kind of online platform. And because there's no good internet, you know, accessibility in Hunchun Peninsula. So these are the problems, but we still need to address them. So we uh, wrote our own training materials, and we sent the materials to our partners. So we had, you know, four trainings to train the partners as to how to, for example, turn on the camera, turn the cam uh, turn the microphone, how to leave a message. So after this uh, familiarization, uh, a pre-meeting training, so they got familiarized with how to use this. So we were able to successfully organize a webinar. And then at that time, more than 70 partners joined us. And many of them are the senior people in our community. So after that successful experience, we feel really confident about you know organizing follow up uh, webinars. So it, we invite you know other people from other communities to share with us. So in the past, you know, people were very busy, engaged in their own communities. So it's not easy for different communities to have an in-depth exchange and learning from each other. So for the recent years, you know, we invited uh, Zhen Manqian from Lingbian to share with us about what their community did during COVID. So we feel really touched and we left a message telling people how, how much we learned. So I think that COVID is actually not so bad because it's a good opportunity for us to have more in-depth uh, communication and exchange. So, so we were thinking about, you know, we can, uh, for example, provide our you know, programs online. So now we have, for example, this online travel offering to parents so that the parents can show this content to their children so they can experience what Hunchun Peninsula has to offer uh, in the comfort of their home. So we provide this kind of online traveling program for people who are stuck at home. So we also have a cooking class, live broadcast with community agricultural products. For example, we teach people how to make a, you know, like onion dish, how to make a traditional Taiwanese cake. So we also, you know, provide a menu. So after watching this cooking class, people can place an order because they all wanted to eat, try these local delicacies. And we also organize our online camps because we were with the uh, a foundation to organize online camps. And we were not able to organize physical camps due to COVID. And because of the Baker's, uh, we work with the Baker's Foundation, 
So we got the idea and we decided to, for example, use the, for example, local delicacies. We sent this uh, meal box of these uh, raw materials to send to the uh, customers so they can cook at home and join our online camps together. So also uh, during the online camps, we have you know experts like or like dancing dancers teaching children, you know how to dance, how to stretch in front of the computer. And because uh, during the camps, we will play a song written by a deceased composer because the composer wrote the song for the world-renowned baker. And in the song, she wrote a lot of uh, things about the Hunchen Peninsula. So it's a very symbolic song for us. So for our online camps, we play the song for the children so that they can dance along with the song. So for my conclusion, we I want to tell you that uh, we address the uh, legitimacy issue. We work with local communities. We let the local uh, government know more about the voice of the local community. So for us, we think that it's important to um, conserve the local flavors, and also it's important for people and the community to coexist in a harmonious way. So for Lishan, for my company, we are here as an observer. So we are helping the local community to be able to operate on their own because when there is no support from the local government or when there is no uh, for example, foundation involvement, they can still operate by themselves. So this is really what we aspire to achieve. So with that, I'm closing my presentation. Thank you. We appreciate this uh, insightful presentation by Mr. Lin. Okay, let's give him another round of applause. In fact, I was very uh, moved by his presentation. And so, uh, Professor Chen, uh, his picture is there. I was uh, exposed to your work actually a long time ago, so I am familiar with the, the kind of um, up and downs that you have um, experienced. Uh, so we appreciate your tenacity, your perseverance, especially you are not from this uh, Hengchun Peninsula, and so people consider you as an outsider. So how do you approach them? How do you get them to listen to you, uh, I understand you must have uh, taken a lot of efforts. And then we already got some involvement from the uh, public uh, gov government sectors, uh, but uh, very often when the government just uh, launched some project, but uh, without the uh, follow-up actions, uh, Sometimes the entire project just peters out. So and, uh, we are very <coughs> grateful to your t attitude to t try to push through such a, a very noble cause in so many communities on this Hongchun uh, Peninsula. We understand the kind of uh, troubles, the kind of obstacles you have faced. Um, now let's get a 20 minutes of break. And please come back around 
10.50, that is uh, 10 minutes before 11, and please do come back at 10.50. As you have heard, we are going to take a 20 minutes break, and please come back on time, and the toilet is uh, on both sides. And if uh, there are too many people, you could also go down to the ground floor. And remember to wear your badge. Uh, today is Saturday, so there will be people checking your badge before they let you in. Ladies and gentlemen, we shall begin the next session shortly. Please uh, switch your mobile phone to silent or vibration mode. And after this presentation, we are going to have a discussion session. Um, you are welcome to fill out a question slips, or you could use our um, electronic forum. Uh, so on the back of your badge, there is a QR code for you to get access into this uh, electronic forum. Now let's welcome back the moderator, Ms. Song Li Ru, to open this session. Now we are going to move on to the next presentation. Before the coffee break, we heard from uh, Mr. Lin about the efforts in the southern part of Taiwan, the Hengchun Peninsula. Now we shall move on to central Taiwan and uh, to the Bunong tribes uh, territory. Uh, um, before that, I would like to offer some ideas about biodiversity. I grew up in the in my tribal land. When I was little, my grandpa tried to take me to my grandma's uh, childhood home, and we have to take a very long trail in the mountains. I was a very little girl, and at that time, the forest was not open to the public. Only tribal people and uh, some wild animals were there. So when I was uh, walking to toward this uh, grandma's childhood home, my grandpa would not talk, just uh, walk silently. And from time to time, he would stop and then at some point and then spray some alcohol. Say. And then in the end, uh, I ask, well, why, why, why did you do that? What was you doing? And my grandpa told me, well, that's the place where some people had arrived or passed through. So, so inside this forest, there was all kinds of uh, animals and uh, plants. And my grandpa told me, well, at, the, at some spot, uh, there was a snake just uh, passed by, so be quiet, uh, show respect when you walk inside the wilderness. 
So now we shall invite um, Ms. Lee uh, to talk about how to sustain the biodiversity uh, because uh, ecology is an uh, important asset of Taiwan. That's the um, core value of Taiwan. Now, Ms. Lee, uh, thank you. Finally, I can take off the mask. It's quite a relief. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great honor to be invited by the Taiwan Ecotourism Association to talk about the development. This. So I'm going to take you to uh, central Taiwan, to a tribal land of the Bunong tribe. And this picture here is a, a work of the Li Zhenning. And this is a very typical farm landscape. I always share this with the Bunong tribal people, saying uh, you are on the upstream in the in this uh, Zhosui Xi. And if you don't protect this ecology upstream, then we won't be get to enjoy this uh, lovely scenery and downstream area, farmland area. Uh, we are going to talk about Dan Da. And this is uh, a, around this. Uh, this is around the Bunong tribe, uh, in, ancestral land. So over here, Nan Tou Xin is right here, and here in the, on this corridor on the north, you uh, uh, you have a uh, Tailuge National Park. On the south, you have Yushan National Park. To the east, uh, you have a uh, Yuli. Wild animal protection area, so you can s s appreciate that there's a biodiversity here. It's a very important, and so altogether there are 100,000 hectares, and the important exit or access road is this uh, Dan Da Trail. I have uh, too many uh, gadgets in my hand. <laughs> Here, we go down. If you want to go there, you could take a highway number 16 here. And this is actually by this uh, Joshua Xi Creek. And four villages are surrounding this area. And there's a Dan Da uh, wild animal habitat is right here uh, next to our four villages. So our village are actually are an important buffer zone here to protect the wild animals. So uh, uh, let me show you this picture again. This is the Danda Forest Trail for here. This is uh, what we call the uh, sustainable de develop uh, a sustainable area. And here, if you want to go to this uh, rainbow color lake, you have to go in here. And this is a very famous um, high mountain lake. And here, our four villages here are important access into the wildlife habitat. So uh, the authorities um, have to put in some thought about how to protect these uh, four villages to develop ecotourism and to serve as a good buffer zone. And here we have a three forest trails. Number one is Dan Da Lin Da is entered through the Dili and the and Ren Lun Trail and the Shuanglong Trail here. So all together, these are these uh, villages uh, scattered around in this area. And together, there are three groups. Ka She, Ran She, and Dan She, and there are some overlaps. Shuanglong Village and Dili Shuanglong Village, the intersection there, the overlap. And over so from this picture, from this map, you can see all together from the Dan, this is a wild animal habitat, uh, the ancestral land and the living environment of these uh, tribal people, and how do we protect this uh, ecology here? 
is, of course, before that, we have to take a stock of this um, biology here. So back in the 2001, after we set up this uh, Danda forestry trail protection areas, and we spent 10 years, the first 10 years, we do all kinds of a survey. And in 2005, we started the ecotourism um, intention uh, survey from the Didi Chun village to see if uh, they are interested in uh, doing ecotourism. So as you can see, the Danda area people, they there's a hunting is a part of this uh, uh, Bunong people's uh, tradition. So a lot of a uh, festival have to be carried out uh, with um, animals that's hunted. For. So when you do this ecotourism, uh, it uh, becomes a, a feasible way models. And so this uh, Nanto authority, they did a, to, to, took a team from a Jingyi University to conduct this uh, feasibility study in year 2015. After this uh, feasibility evaluation, they decided that we could Indeed, we could um, introduce a uh, ecotourism type of activity into the Danda area, and not only the pro environment to, can be protected, but also uh, generate some income stream for them. So, 2016, we have the important people uh, coming in. That was uh, the Taiwan Eco Tourism Association, and uh, Mr. Guo, the president current president and the former president, uh, another person, they come in to do the empowerment work. And I myself had been uh, very honored to be invited by this Ecotourism Association to conduct the training of the guide for ecotourism. So today, we, I would like to share with you how we uh, work on this uh, project and my slides uh, quite a few, so I will be talking very fast um, to share with you the scenery. But before that, uh, I must tell you what did this uh, Ecotourism Association has done. Um, so before that, we have to uh, do the resource inventory work. Uh, there are the governments, there are also this uh, tribal groups and then the local um, operators of uh, ecotourism. Um, after many months, this uh, uh, inventory check, uh, we did this uh, monthly for several months. And uh, so I uh, um, talked to the uh, important uh, stakeholders and with uh, this kind of uh, multiple communications, uh, th we realized that we need a platform to push the work. So we eventually set up this uh, ecotourism uh, association for Dan Da Bunong. And we also need to do empowerment work to train people to uh, provide uh, related services. And we also need uh, some kind of a system uh, or some kind of a framework to train or to certify this um, a guides. And um, uh, so to uh, find a way is, uh, to introduce some business models uh, that will maintain the autonomy of the tribes. And then we also need to do a survey uh, looking back to this environment. And if you are interested, uh, there is a suite and a very elaborated uh, explanation of what had happened over the uh, 10 years. Uh, and how we did this work, how we launched the programs, and how to uh, uh, enable the feedback to the uh, communities. And now I'm going to talk very fast from now on. Uh, in the beginning, we want to see what kind of uh, biodiversity are there to be 
to deserve this ecotourism. Uh, here, this is a scene. This is a Zhenghe village right here on the map. And uh, we look from this side, and then this is a Shredi. And we know Zhenghe is right next to the important access road. And after 10 minutes, you would arrive at the Dili village. The Dili village is here. Uh, my laser pointer is not working. So at the bottom is a Shuanglong. And in the middle is a Didi. And on the top, when you see a small village um, in the background, there's a Tainan. Well, the name is Tainan means the south of a uh, lake. So it, it's actually at the Sun Lake. Could you see that uh, there is a, a, a water body right below the Chinese character Duan, and that's uh, Sun Lake, a famous uh, lake in uh, central Taiwan. And uh, uh, that's why it's a Tainan, uh, south of a lake. Uh, a village is uh, located here, right in the so to the south of the lake. And there's uh, four villages. What are the assets to deserve ecotourism or to have the potential for ecotourism? I've, it seems uh, if I <laughs> go to the other side, then uh, uh, the PowerPoint will now move forward smoothly. Here, this is the scenery of the Renhe villages. And it is right next to the Zhoshui Xi, Zhoshui River. And it has a very special thing. You could stand on the on the bridge and to appreciate this a powerful current or torrent moving through below your feet. And over there, this is an agriculture area. You can see a, a huge areas of uh, um, crops. And this uh, waterfall is called a um, timely waterfall. And it, it, it only appears after the rain. And there are five waterfalls. Four, and the number five is not in the picture. <coughs> So this is um waterfalls after the rain, and the Renhe tribal is a village right at the steps uh, next to a river. And this is a Dili village, and it is famous for this uh, run. And this is uh, looks like a, 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 a fish, so they call it uh, the fish river band. And in addition to this uh, river band, there was some uh, suspension bridge. And the end of this um, our trail is uh, the beginning of the Danda Forest Trail. And there are the bridge. And that's the uh, historic site of the Danda Suspension Bridge. You could also see the uh, two rivers emerge. That's quite uh, spectacular. I myself enjoy the sunset. This is looking west, so this is my secret place. Over there, you can enjoy this wonderful sunset. And here, I, I'm standing in the Didi, and I can see Shuanglong across the river. It's um, on top of this uh, river, and it is uh, the highest village among the four. So if it comes. If it, you go to this uh, village, you can see the Didi uh, from up top down. And over there, this is a, a tea plantation. And government has uh, invested uh, some resources. So uh, this is a Shuanglong suspension bridge uh, to attract the tourists. And 
when the strong Hmong people begin to develop their own businesses, and and this is a strong Hmong uh, Starbucks uh, using the same name, and this is uh, my favorite spot. Again, from this uh, tea plantation, I could look west to see the sunset. Today, I would like to invite you to uh, come and uh, take uh, photographs because uh, this is a wonderful scenery. It deserves a, a much better uh, photographs. And you can also see the Xunguangsi on the uh, Summer Lake. And then now we come to the Tannan, south of the uh, lake. And it is famous for the uh, fireflies. And this is, although it's a small village, but you can see some of these um, uh, motifs. And wherever you go, you can see there's a Catholic church. Uh, this is Di uh, from Dili. This is a uh, Renhe. This is Tannan. All of them uh, has a uh, very unique features, uh, so it it's um, worthwhile for you to uh, pay a visit. I I have learned that uh, whenever you want to talk to villagers, you just come to the church. If if no one can be seen on the street, and here this is a. Uh, a picture to help you understand the Bunong tribe. And the male will have uh, this uh, white shirt. A uh, female will always wear the black. And they have uh, all kinds of uh, f uh, festivals for <coughs> melee or hunting. And, and this place uh, claims to be the earliest uh, habitat of the Bunong people, and they are the the tribe that was the uh, last uh, to be succumbed to the Japanese colonial rule. So when I talk to them, these uh, Bunong people, they uh, are very principled. They know what to do and what not to do. And here, uh, Didi on the top this is Didi uh, at the bottom is Tanan. They have all kinds of um, a walk sculptures uh, during the COVID nineteen. Yeah, yeah. And when I went, they, uh, everybody was <laughs> was uh, had a mask, facial mask. Uh, there was uh, during the the uh, p pandemic. And if you go to the other village, you get uh, to see different type of uh, sceneries. This uh, bridge was uh, rebuilt after typhoon. And over there, you can see those motif uh, uh, for women and for men, men for hunting, a woman is carrying um, the crops. And in this uh, school, this uh, primary school, they have a uh, wall sculpture. And in the Tainan Chun, again, it is um, to the south of the Samwen Lake. And this is a house for the hunters. And this is, is a famous, uh, and this is a real hunters. And there are many uh, skulls. That, that is uh, the achievement of this hunter. And in terms of cultural work, I enjoy going to this um, Renhe Guoxiao. And this is a, it's called a flame tree, like a fire on fire. And here, this is an elephant. And that's a slide for children. But you know, uh, this uh, tree must be very tall. And they also have a 100 year old camphor tree. And in this school, there are uh, other things that. Uh, symbolizing the Bunong tribe's uh, culture. And here, uh, w there are different types of uh, festivals, such as uh, for, this is uh, for a newborn baby, and this is uh, for uh, uh, young boys to uh, enter into uh, puberty. It's like a rite of passage. And these, the left two are not open to the public. On the right hand side, they have a public celebration. And I went to Kardashian. Uh, this is has lots of a roasted pig. Here, there's a four tribes 
only uh, on breakfast is only available at uh, this place, one village, and for for lunch, this is the only place. Uh, and the Sikaka, he says, uh, you forget to go home because the food is uh, so good. And they have uh, local specialties, uh, long shi vegetables, and the, uh, it has a uh, nong specific uh, uh, delicacies to offer. And if you come in the group, tourist group, they have a kitchen. They could offer you um, a big meals uh, with um, appointment or reservation. And when we go to such places, there's a Shuanglong and Didi, and there's lots of a uh, place to stay overnight. And and in Renghe, you could only stay in the church. So not, not too many choices here. And when we, after we understand the general aspect of these uh, four villages, now let's talk about the forest trails. After three years of uh, uh, investigation, here is a summary in Dandao Forest Trail as the, at the end of uh, highway number 16. And this bridge was uh, washed away by a typhoon. Um, and this is actually a part of this uh, cross island east-west road. And it has been a, the the bridge has been destroyed many times by typhoon, um, um, but for the Thai power companies, uh, they would do some uh, maintenance work of the uh, power grid uh, during the dry season, and for this uh, biology survey, and this is a very long trail. So from this uh, five hundred meter altitude to 3,000 meter altitude, we could see all kinds of uh, change in the forest of places. Uh, uh, here, over here, you can see that there's a wild animals. These are the wild animals you can see here. And along this uh, forest trail, uh, because there's a lot of uh, collapsed uh, uh, slopes, uh, uh, we could also see some um, critically endangered the species, two of them, and eat. And also in our report, we also show you some ornamental or unique plants that you can uh, enjoy. You will see these plants growing along the sides of the forest road. So here you can see, well, uh, at this place, there is a lot of collapsed uh, walls and terrains. And this is the elder forests and the elder parasites plants. So they look like poodles, right? Look at the ears. In terms of the animal resources, when you enter uh, at, uh, when you arrive at Liu Fen Su at 30, uh, 23 kilometers, you can see a lot of traces of different animals. For example, this is the trace left by birds, and you can see a lot of activities of wildlife. So we can see we, according to our survey, you know, there are 16 types, 16 species of animals, and then 14 of them are ende uh, endemic species. So this is a very important uh, environment for the wildlife conservation. So here I would like to show you this uh, place. This, uh, this is at about 15 kilometer. And so we can see this is a very, you know, fragmented terrain. So actually there is a van. Do you see that? You can see this is what the road used to look like. So at year one, we uh, when we went there, you know, we actually walked on this uh, collapsed road to do our survey. So you can see we have to really pay attention to the safety of transportation. And here, this is Shuanglong Forest Road. 
So it takes about 30 minutes to arrive at this Shuanglong uh, Forest Road. So you can see the uh, the dark green is the um, forest road accessible by cars, and the light green is accessible by people and hunters. So here we can see traces of an abundance of wildlife. So at Shuanglong Forest Road, we have identified very special species. For example, here you can see, uh, for example, Taiwan, you know, uh, the beans and other types of plants. So here we can see at specific uh, seasons, you are able to see special plants that look like this. So here you can see this is a crystal orchid, and then actually the flower only you know remain for a month before you know they wither. And here you can see, for example, you know different animals and deer and so on. So you can identify this kind of special animals in the mountain. And this is Renlun Forest Road. So this is a very long road. So we started from uh, Renhe Elementary School, and then we go to different milestones. So we can see that it takes about 15 minutes to arrive at the second milestone. So we only stop at very special um, spots. And after the 17th kilometer, we will plan to uh, design a trekking path for guides uh, led, led by tour guides. So we actually put an infrared camera in this cave. So we're able to have a sighting of this very special animal. So I just want to quickly show you this uh, slice because you know we're running out of time. So in terms of the conservation of biodiversity, so we actually uh, divided our conservation work into two parts. One is on the side of the community. The other is on the side of the forest road. So here you can see I let uh, people to monitor uh, the species. So this is community empowerment. So it's a five-year program. So for the first year is a basic. We focus on basic training. Second year we focus on the community end and the forest road end. And on year three, we have you know practical walkthrough. So people can participate in relevant uh, trainings and walk through. So here, you know, we have, for example, group discussions, training courses, and then pilots itinerary and so on. And for public affair participation, we have meeting participation and environmental protection. So on year four, so this is about, this is on the end of the forest road. So we are still doing evaluation. We continue to do monitoring. And are we going to set up more, for example, interpretation stations? So we have trained some uh, seed trainers and then we hope then we hope that they can train more people so we can see senior uh, lecturers lead younger lecturers to show them how to provide uh, explanation and interpretation services as tour guides and also we have to make sure that we have comprehensive planning for the uh, forest road end. So we have different uh, activities and we also provide different experiences 
for tourists. For example, there is a tea tasting session so that uh, here you can taste a very special kind of tea provided by the Bunong community. And actually, we set up a cross community ecotourism platform. So we can see here uh, there are different parts, for example, tour guides, uh, kitchen, uh, hands on experience, accommodation, and transportation. So here uh, they organize uh, different services for people. For example, here. Uh, there are uh, some requirements uh, that need to be followed by, for example, the tour guides, the travel agencies, and so on. And they have to uh, abide by a, a management convention. For example, they need to have you know certain hours of training, and then they need to serve certain numbers of groups for them to be able to qualify for the next year. So we really need to you know, adhere to this convention to be able to serve as a tour guide. For example, you need to uh, participate in meeting in your work, and then you have to make sure that you do not uh, uh, violate certain uh, requirements. So here we can see we also give back to the community and to the environment. For example, we set up a public welfare funds for the community. So we have different, you know, a percentage of uh, rebates contributing back to the community. With the leadership of uh, Mr. Guo, and uh, we Actually, you can see our presence on different social media outlets. And now you can see for the Dan Da Buno Ecotourism Association, we also uh, work with the government to uh, serve, uh, to maintain this uh, website and to provide relevant services. And for the Forest roads. We know that when we do, uh, when we, if we want to offer um, a special experience for tourists, well, it actually, it's not. Uh, it's not a difficult. It's not an easy task. So we have to think about how to, for example, set up basic uh, amenities for the comfort. Of the tourists, so we invite the Dan Da Buno Eco Tourism Association and also the local management office to set up this kind of amenities. So we also provide, for example, like toilet facilities to the tourists. So actually, Mr. Sun is also here. He is from the local management office. So he says that he wants to use Shuanglong Forest Road as a pilot project to let people know that you know how much improvement can be made uh, along these forest roads. So here are some pictures showing you the renovation and improvement of the local environment. So here we tore down a hunter's shelter, and then we have this, uh, you know, this crane to uh, lift, you know, heavy wood, and it required a lot of, you know, uh, men to do the heavy lifting. So it's really not an easy task. And also, we constructed our, you know, ecological toilets, and the toilets are set up at a very, you know, a hidden spot. And then we didn't, you know, we didn't dig deep, only thirty uh, centimeters, and this are actually movable, uh, compost style toilets.
And after the completion of the project, we asked the local community to adopt this uh, facility so that they can do the follow-up maintenance and the services. And for our association, we are responsible for uh, taking tourists to visit the uh, forest road. So that means the two associations work hand in hand. So for these four communities, and then of course we're working hard, but we can see we are still one mile away from the community's autonomous, sustainable operation. So we have to think about, you know, after the phasing out of the professional teams, what will happen next? And because we uh, we expect to see a re-election of the third board of directors and supervisors, and because the previous director uh, for the two boards were the same person who knew about ecotourism very well, but we don't know about this upcoming new director. And then here we have three communities. So if you're familiar with the Qi Cai uh, Lake, you know, actually there are people, uh, there are actually a motorbike agency who uh, take tourists to the mountain by, you know, motorcycles. And then that's really not friendly to the environment. And then it's important to get the support of the local residents to continue with our program. And also it's important to form mutual trust and cooperation between the public sector and the private sector so that we can go a long way. So I told you about the mechanism and the operation of the Ecotourism Association. And then after learning these principles, the communities are able to operate on their own. But if they want to refine the programs, if they want to uh, encourage the tourists to come back, they actually need to learn more. They need to, in, there's still a long way to go. We can see the Bruno people are very honest. You know, they are really nice people. You know, they do whatever you tell them. But they don't, you know, they are not very innovative. They don't think of new ideas. So we ask uh, tourists whether they are satisfied with their experiences in the Bruno community. Well, the tourists say they were happy, but actually there are not a lot of, you know, uh, repeat customers. Why is that? You have to make sure that you have to really move the tourists. You have to make them want to come back. I think that is a key here. So we need to help the local community to develop more in-depth offerings. So here I'll, I'm ha helping the local communities to grow uh, local delicacy special plants and so on so that we can use this as uh, ingredients for local specialty cooking. So we actually, uh, we were able to uh, launch a new brand of a bitter tea oil. So we use this kind of oil in the cooking. So we incorporate this oil in different hands-on activities. So this program is very successful, it's very well received. And we know there are a lot of the farmers uh, there use unconventional farming uh, technology, but we want to encourage them to convert their conventional approach to an organic one. So if we're able to have a successful transformation, this is going to be very successful. And then actually, uh, uh, in only within only two years into the renovations, we see the traces, for example, leopard, uh, leopard cats and the pangolians 
we can see these animals, you know, appearing in this kind of environment. That means that as long as we, you know, change the environment, wildlife will notice that. They will just uh, enjoy their new habitat. But in that case, we have to really, you know, pay attention to whether hunters will come along as well. So with that, I'm closing my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Yeah, let's give her another round of applause for entering the Buno tribal land to appreciate the scenery, the biology, and, and she said there's a last mile to be covered. It's probably going to take some time. So we Buno tribal people are looking forward to it because in the in the community we have to uh, elect a new leader every three years. Uh, so sometimes you get a disruption. That's why we say you have to uh, appreciate that there's kind of uh, uh, obstacles, the three years uh, as one cycle. So of course, we our people need to be more conscious, more aware of uh, such a new potentials to develop ecotourism. Now we shall invite the moderators and the Professor Chen Mei Hui and the two speakers to come to the stage for a foreign discussion. We understand Peter Richard is also online. Microphone, please. Uh, we are very honored to have Professor Chen here. I have read uh, Professor Chen's uh, papers, many, many of them. Um, she used to be a government um, civil servant, but she decided to uh, come to our tribal land uh, to uh, work with uh, tribal people to develop uh, ecotourism. Uh, so let's welcome Professor Chen to offer some introduction information. Uh, allow me to um, use a little time to cover some ideas uh, as a summary. And good morning, or actually almost good afternoon. We have uh, listened to three presentations. Now allow me to offer some comments to get the ball rolling. The emergence of the uh, ecotourism uh, I believe uh, these are the three reasons uh, based on my observations. We, we know that ecotourism is uh, the actual practice of sustainable tourism. It, it also takes care of the sustainability of uh, the, the welfare of uh, local people and the and the uh, biology and ecology of the place. Uh, number two, uh, because uh, when we talk about this uh, preserving the biodiversity, we want to see this uh, participation, the involvement of the local communities. Uh, th th therefore, we want to get the people there to 
participate to also contribute their uh, efforts to preserve this uh, bio diversity so we need to get the local people to be involved and so that's like offering this uh, potential to them and then we talk about this um, satoyama decoration and we know if we want to develop a village we have to maintain we have to preserve this um, uh, bi biodiversity in order to help the local community, especially the remote villages, to offer uh, this uh, protection of the ecology. And we also need to integrate the uh, science and technology uh, and uh, the local knowledge. And we want to make a place that's a resilient uh, um, so with the ecotourism, it offers all these uh, benefits uh, to help uh, the local community to have a sustainable development. And at the same time, we won't want to put all the eggs in one basket. So under this uh, philosophy of Satoyama, we can help a remote village to find the various way to c conduct um, Satoyama activity. So ecotourism is the, a way to optimize a place. Um, um, and if you just want to rely on tourism, and uh, it's very dangerous because um, uh, once the, you have a pe epidemic, then uh, tourism will not come. So we have to give this some thoughts uh, and still give a lot of room for the primary production, that is uh, farming. Um, crop and ecotourism is not just a, is a product for small people. Rather, it is it helps to motivate. It helps to trigger the development of a place. It, it it's going to form a atmosphere where the culture, where the ecology will be well respected and preserved, and uh, while. There is also a steady income revenue, and local people will be empowered to make critical decisions for themselves to uh, to maximize the welfare to for the local residents. And nowadays, people talk about community development. I think ecotourism is a, a wonderful approach, and people say from local to global. It helps you to develop deep economy, um, in particularly for the um, remote villages. It's it's a deep economy. It's not the kind of a superficial uh, industrial type of economy we see in the cities. So we want to have a, a full integrations of um, a local nature and local residents and local activities. And the so-called deep economy, it, it grows slowly, but it would uh, take uh, roots very deep before it prosper. And we know a lot of uh, young people, they were expected to go to uh, develop a career in the cities. But nowadays, uh, we want to the young people to go uh, to a place where they could uh, fulfill their their potentials uh, rather than just uh, making a lot of money in the city. So ecotourism actually offer the stage, offer the opportunities for young people to fulfill their aspiration. And Satoyama capital turned into a deep economy. We we now see uh, more and more places where the deep economy is uh, prospering, and ecotourism give us some positive examples. However, there are some hidden difficulties. In the past, the industrial type of economy uh, ruined the environment and also make young people leave their hometown, and so the culture cannot be preserved. 
uh, from generation to generation. But now with the uh, ecotourism, you get to develop a uh, uh, deep economy and to cultivate the social capitals. And for in terms of uh, ecotourism, uh, 10 years ago when I tried to tell people what ecotourism, they didn't know what that is. They thought it was too far-fetched, too, too um, abstract, because they always think about well, a lot of good, big group of people buying and eating and then sleeping. Uh, but now we also have to think about uh, the kind of uh, eco tourism products of, um, that's uh, marketable and uh, and uh, accepted by the market but uh, most of the consumers they want something small uh, uh, with a big portion but cheap but we know uh, ecotourism products uh, tend to be refined and uh, in small quantities so that's um, a little more expensive than those uh, mass produced uh, products so we have to find a way to to identify the unique features of uh, your eco products in order to uh, generate the appeal to the consumers to your tourists And when ecotourism actually has a, a very rigorous um, rules to follow, I think there are <laughs> 30 aspects and the 36 indices uh, to introduce uh, ecotourism into the, uh, a village. It's not like um, it's not a. a fragmented approach so you have to have uh, overall the uh, pictures uh, about these uh, ideas in order to develop ecotourism for a place so in the beginning you have to identify this uh, unique and uh, rare and uh, uh, outstanding features of a place in order to develop a wonderful products and the pr and uh, as the previous speaker also talked about, you need to do the monitoring and surveillance and the production. And then it takes a long, long time just to uh, forge the consensus of And then we also need to some kind of agreement, some kind of rules to follow in order for the, the system to move forward, to operate smoothly. Uh, that's why we need an organization and the empowerment. That's the uh, basic idea to, for you to build up the strength. And this also included uh, all kinds of uh, opportunities for you to innovate, to create. And we, our speakers already talked about these opportunities to generate the so I would like to refocus on our efforts here. First one, in terms of community empowerment, we know that people are the most important thing. So we have to make sure that we can form a consensus. We have to let the local community know that this is not just about making profits. If it's only about making profits, we cannot go a long way because ecotourism is all about sustainability. So we are not talking about the economic side it, because if you make uh, the local residents to have a, you know, too high of an expectation, so that is going to be a disaster. And then you have to make sure that you need to have a leader and the collective efforts to devote in ecotourism. And you need to have an intermediary group to work with the community. And in the end, the community have to be able to operate on their own. And when you set up a good system, and we know that in social capital, the most important thing is mutual trust. And the last thing is about sustainability. Now we see uh, aging of the uh, partners and then we have to make sure that we can you know infuse new blood to replace the aging uh, workforce so we have to know about our target audience to know who to sell our programs to 
So you have to have very clear market segmentation. You need to have a very clear positioning of a brand because what we offer is high quality and eco-friendly products. And we need to be able to identify our channel because we cannot focus on the mass market. And lastly, I want to talk about two things. So in the past, all, communi all communities work in alone, work in silos. But now we can see the time has changed. So we have to think about DMO, destination management organization. It's important to have this kind of organization because we cannot only rely on one organization to do everything. It's important to construct an entire supply chain. At every part, every link of the supply chain is very important. And lastly, I want to tell you that it's important to have relevant rules and regulations in place. We have to make sure that we can comply with the law to have the backing, the support of the law. Because ecotourism is not just about the economy, it also serves the role as a um, environmental conservation. So this is not, you know, just a, another type of tourist program. So when we talk about place making, the uh, legitimacy issue is something that we all have to face. Now we see, you know, so many different, you know, uh, community-based ecotourism programs going on, but actually it's a collective effort of different stakeholders. However, with this kind of advancement of programs, our you know, rules and regulations are still falling behind. So we have to make sure that the government is able to revise relevant policies to catch up with the trend. I think uh, I'm actually overrunning here. I want to apologize for the moderator, but you know, we hope to see that you know families can work together as a team to conserve for the local community. And it's important for us to uh, pay our attention and work together to protect our uh, CBT. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chen, for your wonderful presentation. CBT is not just about, you know, making money. It's about sustainability. So that means that, you know, we have to conserve the environment. And it requires the collective efforts of the communities, travel agencies, and tourists. So I want to thank Professor Chen for your presentation. And then we have several questions here on the internet and the first one is that well based on the consideration of environmental carrying capacity the number of tourists that can be served by tourism is limited how to provide sufficient economic income incentives for the community how to mobilize communities with sufficient agricultural income to participate in the promotion of ecotourism so as to achieve ecological sustainability and environmental co-management policies. Well, for us, for what we do is that, of course, we learn from Professor Chen. And then she let us know that there are actually more possibilities. So she actually developed a lot of different projects and then we use the principles back in the Hanchuan Peninsula because we know there are high and low seasons of tourism. During low season, what should the residents do? You know, that means that we need to provide them with different capabilities 
For example, in for our partners in Hengchun, you know they are、uh, tour guides slash farmers, so that they can have they can generate enough income for themselves. It's. We, of course, we need to have we need to generate enough profits for this model to continue to operate. So we have been working very closely with Professor Chen so that we can form a more complete、uh, supply chain so that we can allow the residents to continue to devote themselves. And then, of course, we you know we are developing, and then we don't know when we we are able to develop a mature system. It it takes time. And how do we mobilize? And how do we mo mobilize communities with sufficient agricultural income to participate in the promotion of eco tourism, so as、uh, achieve ecological sustainability and environmental management policies? Can I ask Jia Xin to share with us? So when the community, when the farmers already have enough sufficient agricultural income, so you talk about the bitter oil, the bitter tea oil example. So can you elaborate on that? So enough sufficient agricultural produce. Well, I don't think agricultural produce will be enough because our precondition is that. We have to use a way、uh, to be friendly to the environment for growing. For example, for our bitter tea oil, there are eighteen farmers here.、Oh, we can see、oh, totally there are eighteen farmers in the community, but only one third of them are willing to devote use this eco-friendly way for growing. So we help the six of them to. Uh, provide coaching for them. For example, we uh, uh, purchase their products at a higher price, so we make sure that they can have enough profits to carry out to carry on their friendly farming approach, so they can maintain thirty percent of the profits. And also during the process, I、uh, reiterate, I. Told my the farmers that we there's still a long way to go. We need to make adjustment, for example, in their production volume, and also in their professional skills. It takes at least three years for them to be able to see a scale of economy. So we are willing to devote in this pilot program. So during the process of transformation, I try to locate, for example, subsidies. For them now, because we have a sighting of leopard leopard cats, so we can apply for, you know, for example, subsidies from the government because leopard cats are endangered species in Taiwan, and also two of the farmers got a green label from the government. That means, you no, know, they are part of the eco-friendly growing organization, so they are able to get subsidies from that organization. By doing so, you know, they serve as an income stream、uh, during the transformation process. It boosts their confidence level, and also we use a pre-sale model to help them to secure, you know, income. And then we provide customers feedback to them, so they can have enough confidence and to continue growing、uh, the produce、uh, with this friendly way. And also, we have an ideal because for the Bunong community, Bunong people love to drink and smoke, and we. Hope that through the improvement of the environment, we can communicate with them, you know, a healthier lifestyle. And also, Mr. Lin talk about, you know, people have different jobs. For example, the one of the farmers is a, of course, he's a farmer, and then he owns a、uh, eatery. A、uh, restaurant, small restaurant, and also he provides、uh, lunches 
to local schools. So that means you know he had he has you know he has all kinds of different jobs. He had, he's a slashy. So that's about my case. So can we invite the uh, participants, you know, on the floor to raise questions? And please identify yourself before you raise your questions. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak out. As uh, you can see, growth takes time. Uh, Mr. Lai and Ms. Li and myself are the first generations of uh, eco-tourism um, promoters. Uh, I was the president, and she was the secretary, and one of them was the uh, uh, administrators. So that's because they were dedicated to the job, to the mission. They had aspiration. but. We also need a uh, science uh, uh, basis, meaning they have conducted a survey of this uh, biodiversity. Um, as uh, 100 years ago, people would try to uh, promote uh, science and democracy, but did not succeed. But now we have uh, both uh, tools to do it. However, uh, with uh, aspiration, we need we cannot generate powers. So we need a science and the, and democracy in order to get things going. So it takes time for any th living things to grow up. So that's the only way to sustain the growth. As uh, I was a uh, pioneer in this work, uh, that's why uh, I'm still here because with my heart of dedication, I want to keep on doing this to dedicate to uh, this uh, noble cause. And these are only comments, not question. And uh, Mr. Mr. Richards is there. Could you care to uh, respond to the three questions? It's a uh, very, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much. So yeah, it's it's. So the, the first, please may I say that the options by the other speakers were absolutely fantastic. They were so interesting uh, by um, uh, Mr. Lin and Miss Lee. So I've been here listening. Um, it's a very interesting question, uh, carrying capacity on one side versus how to provide sufficient incentive to motivate community members and motivate businesses to get involved. Uh, I think uh, the first thing for us to consider is even though we may be passionate about community-based ecotourism, we have to accept from the start that it may or may not be Uh, the right activity in any person. So even though we may want to kind of uh, lobby for it and, and be passionate about it, uh, we have to have a very thorough uh, feasibility process and uh, do trust building and talk carefully to the local people. If they do have sufficient uh, income and they're very happy with their existing agricultural uh, lifestyle, then they may not have the motivation to participate and in the end it won't work. So uh, at the same time, there are lots of, there are lots of different people in communities so while some people may be uh, happy with their current lifestyle and not want to change, there may be people who are interested and excited to try something new. So we need to have an open process and welcome people, maybe initially quite a small number of people who want to try out uh, uh, ecotourism. Um, I think um, it's important in the carrying capacity side, important for us to recognize that carrying capacity, it's a mixture of uh, quantitative and qualitative factors. So it doesn't mean that more people are necessarily worse and less people are necessarily better. It really depends on the behavior of the, of the tourists uh, and, and what kinds of guests as well that the community uh, like to meet. So one way to motivate it, 
a community who is fair, doesn't need uh, additional income, uh, is, is uh, through making their community a study centre, which is a source of pride for them and students, uh, university students, school students, other study groups from other parts of Taiwan or around the world will come and study their uh, agricultural or eco uh, or sustainable development success stories. And these can be big groups, you know, we're not talking about uh, groups of three or four uh, fam uh, FIT travellers, but maybe 60 students. But if it's well managed, they can be very motivating uh, for the community members and they, can, and they can give people a sense of pride, which is uh, above and beyond uh, income. So that, that's what I have to share. So yeah, thank you so much, everybody. It's been super interesting so far. Thanks. Okay, thank you. 谢谢，特别谢谢这个Peter来帮我们做一个回应。最后，we appreciate Peter's response to the question, and perhaps we have time for one more question. Anyone? Oh, there's one. Uh, because uh, Ari is uh, online. So maybe I will ask the question. So wondering any cases or the most successful CBT uh, cases in Indonesia. So I think probably you can get us some implications as well. Thank you. Please, uh, please arrive. Wait, uh, okay. speaker. This Ari is a speaker for the afternoon. He is going to talk about this army. So I am uh, trying to explain to the audience. Uh, uh, you have a wonderful example to share, a success story to share. Go on, please. Ari, please. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, morning, and thank you very much for all speakers. It is very interesting. And I agree, actually, with Peter at the last uh, talking about the numbers is actually you should depend on the management. If you focus on the management, that it's actually we can manage. On the, uh, based on my experience, for instance, actually, uh, if we want to help the community, for uh, you should a different look, the angle of looking of the tourism itself. For us in the ecotourism of Indonesia, we look is how to help the community to manage their resources sustainably. So that, that is the mindset that we put it in the beginning. So it's not talking about tourism since the beginning, but it's talking how they manage the uh, resources sustainably. In this case, for instance, later on in the afternoon, I will share and how that community, you should calculate costs and benefits of the people who are involved time consuming, how much the time they're spending. I, uh, the design of the ecotourism uh, or the design of community-based tourism, it should be, should be very carefully designed. For instance, that in, in my case, we design one community is only spending one or two days per week for tourism. And then the rest, they should be controlled. Uh, they still keep on their uh, as an agriculture, if they are agriculture, as an agriculture. So they, they still keep uh, moving their own resources as, as they are as a community, you know. So that is a very important to calculate that. So then uh, the, the way how you do it is in the management. In this system, we involve as much as possible of the community but you need to have a, develop a system where the community only spending uh, not all their week of a time for tourist, tourism, but it's, you know, it's tourism as an alternative income or as I call it as a bonus 
for their life. So, but actually, you keep them still in their uh, normal life. You know, that that is my 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 experience. Later on in the afternoon, we'll share more. Allow me to explain. I really was saying uh, when we talk about CBT, this kind of idea in the beginning is not for tourism, it's for the management of resources and the people, the manpower, and how to set up a good system in order to have a good, uh, successful eco tourism. So you have to find a way to manage the resources. And we have uh, speakers here. Any additional comments? In fact, ecotourism will bring additional income, but after years of observation, um, not everybody is motivated by money. Uh, some people, they want to know better about their homeland. And some of them want to elevate their own uh, culture, um, um, humanistic uh, um, learning. And some are here to uh, look for partners uh, to exchange ideas with. So not everybody is motivated by money. And when we do this kind of um, uh, ecotourism, we will be doing uh, the, the friendly um, agriculture method. So for some people, uh, they come to participate in the ecotourism because uh, uh, over here, we offer you the opportunity to do organic farming techniques. And during the process, you will be able to develop some uh, very uh, education um, uh, oriented uh, programs. Uh, so although they already have a good um, agricultural practices, uh, but then they will be able to elevate themselves. And then there are ways uh, to say you could, uh, through this uh, ecotourism, you could also uh, make a better use of uh, some of these um, um, s uh, uh, byproducts from your farming activities uh, and uh, also help you to uh, be very creative. So that, that's what I observed. Over the past few years, we have also seen this kind of uh, uh, phenomena. Uh, we, we are pushing a lot of a uh, project in the tribal land to do this kind of integration of, of uh, agriculture with uh, ecotourism. So we would like to see more uh, sustainable ecotourism uh, that's um, uh, blossoming in Taiwan. Anyone would like to offer the last words? Um, for the last words, I would like to say this. Whether it's a Satoyama mission or whether this is um, uh, ecotourism, I believe this is more like a uh, prospering of this uh, environmental ethics, that's how we treat our environment. Like uh, Professor Chen said, some people want to do ecotourism to know their homeland better. Some people are here to find uh, 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 partners that are dedicated to the same cause. And so for this, uh, it's a very rewarding to be able to find uh, people to do the same thing with you. So like uh, in the Bunong tribal land, uh, some people, they found that through this ecotourism, they were able to uh, revive some of the traditional knowledge and to honor their ancestral land. So these farmers, they are waiting to um, switch to um, organic farming and to introduce uh, the ecotourism to uh, get associated with uh, his organic farming activities. And this also helped to educate the uh, tourists uh, to know the land, to know our home.
then the better. I would like to elaborate on the manpower uh, situation because uh, we will see that uh, people are aging, so our partners are getting old, and we are facing this uh, very critical situation. Only a uh, true uh, interpreters or guides are still around, and a, a previous generation are already getting senile. So in order to pass on the baton, we have to find a new blood. And so in, when we talk about this community, we begin to think about the like, uh, children. They are they are now in the, a teenage. So we are thinking about the possibility of uh, cultivating them into guide because for ecotourism, uh, age could not be a, a restriction, uh, but would that be uh, exploitation of uh, child labor? So, so the Ministry of Labor <laughs> said uh, you don't have to pay them money. It could do other way type of a reward because we do need this manpower to do this guiding work. So we can invite this teenage students and help them to do this. So they don't have to go to other places for a career because previously there was no economic opportunities for young people to stay home to um, raise a family. And now with uh, this kind of ecotourism, we offer them uh, additional alternatives uh, to stay in a hometown and, and still you could uh, develop some meaningful uh, career. And maybe uh, to generate a new style of uh, services and also to uh, help the, the tribal land to prosper. And so to maybe uh, next year at this conference, I will have uh, better news for you. And Peter would like to offer a th three minutes conclusion. Peter. Okay, hello, everybody. But perhaps not three minutes. But first of all, um, I I'd like to say that I listened to Mr. Lin's presentation and uh, the work that you have done to improve the quality of life of uh, senior citizens through tourism is, is really credible. It's so inspiring. It was so useful and so interesting. And one of the highlights for me, um, I, I've been lucky enough to work uh, on tour guide training uh, in uh, indigenous villages. And uh, we have the same issue where the people who hold the traditional knowledge are often old, uh, but of course uh, we have to uh, reach out to the young generation and so we, we often train <clears throat> the young generation together with the old generation. And we have like a buddy system where an older uh, community member might be a mentor, for example, for a group of guides. And uh, when, when we are brainstorming the stories in the different uh, interpretation spots, uh, the, the older man or lady will, will share their story. And then the young generation will practice um, interpreting this in, a, in an interesting way. And then the seniors will listen and they will give advice. And this actually, uh, it, it can really educate uh, as well the young people about the stories, the relationships with the environment, herbal medicines, traditional arts, and so on. Uh, many times the, the young people have gone to school or university outside the community. They haven't had the chance to learn these traditional knowledge and wisdom. And so this is something I would like to share with you. Maybe it's useful. And I wish you so much luck in, in your very meaningful and useful work. Thank you very much. 谢谢，因为时间的关系。Well, in the interest of time, we are going to close the session. If you have any additional questions, please raise them to the organizer, and then they will respond to you as soon as possible. So, I want to thank the three speakers of the session. I want to also thank Professor Chen. So, with that, I'm concluding this session. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, Director Song, for moderating the third session. So we are moving on to our lunch break. And then we will end the lunch break by 1 p.m. So please return to the venue by 1 p.m. So for your lunch box, uh, your lunch will come in a stainless steel box. And then uh, we will go to the seventh floor to enjoy your lunch. So after you finish your meal, please return the stainless box. And then I will see you back at 1 p.m. Thank you.